Hey everyone, welcome back to Required Reading, where we're continuing our read of uh, the novelization of Gremlins, uh, written by George Guype. Today we're reading chapter 8. <clears throat> the few days remaining before Christmas passed quickly, except for the youngsters of Kingston Falls Junior Senior High School, because of a heavy early snowfall in November, which had canceled classes for nearly a week. The pre-Christmas vacation had been shortened by two days, which meant that classes seemed to drag on interminably. If the kids didn't like this state of affairs, Roy Hansen liked it even less. Getting their attention was difficult enough under the best of circumstances. Breaking through the wall of lethargy so close to Christmas was another definition of impossible. Still, one had to try. That was part of the challenge of teaching, and if there was one thing Roy Hansen liked, it was a challenge. The first black instructor at an exclusive private school in the country, he had left there three years ago to become only the second black teacher in Kingston Falls. Now at 34, he was recognized as one of the best biology and natural science instructors in the area. Tall and stockily built, he was a teacher with whom few students messed. Corporal punishment in the public schools was a thing of the past of course, but at times Hansen could be so roused by an uncooperative student that some wondered if there might be a one-day revival. Keeping the class members a bit nervous, particularly the potential troublemakers, was part of Hansen's strategy, and it generally worked. Soon he had no undercurrents of crosstalk to compete with, and certainly no overt wisecracks. That was exactly the way he wanted it. There were limits, of course. He could command their attention, but not necessarily their interest. Recognizing this, he decided to abandon their study of the circulatory system of the frog in favor of an illustrated talk he had worked up dealing with new animals. It was a pet, so to speak, topic, to which he had dedicated considerable research. Some day he hoped to sell it as an article or monograph in a scholarly magazine. One thing was sure, if he could raise these students from their lethargy with it, it had to have something. We hear a lot about animals becoming extinct, he began. But what we don't hear much about is some new animals which have only recently been discovered. In 1812, a scientist named Georges Cuvier announced that every species that existed on Earth had been discovered already. But he was wrong. Pressing the slide-changing button, he produced a photo of a deer-like animal with long, wavy horns. Anybody know the name of this animal? he asked. No one did. It's called an okaipi, and it's a close relation to the giraffe. Man didn't see the first live okapi until 1900. He changed the slide. Anyone know the name of this animal? He asked. No one did. He told them about the mountain nyula, pygmy hippopotamus, Komodo dragon, Andean wolf, Congo peacock, cupri, cochleanth, and long-nosed peccary, all of which had been discovered, or rediscovered, during the 20th century. No one knew anything, and no one volunteered any questions, except Pete Fontaine. Mr. Hansen? he asked. Hansen nodded, silently thankful that someone got something more out of this lecture than twenty minutes worth of daydreaming. Yes? Is it worth anything if you discover a new animal? It was, Roy Hansen thought, a surprisingly good question. Embarrassingly... He didn't know the answer. I really guess it depends, he replied. I suppose if you found one animal that the government or a zoo wanted very badly, you could sell it for a good sum. Most scientists are more interested in the glory that goes with such a discovery, though. That would mean money, wouldn't it? Pete persisted. I mean, they could go on TV and recommend pet food and stuff? The class giggled. Roy Hansen smiled, and Pete beamed at having created a joke without having to brave the teacher's wrath. 
A mild chain reaction was caused by Pete's question. One student asked where you could go in hopes of finding a new species. Another asked how you could tell if an animal was new, or just something strange he had never seen before. It was all academic, of course, since there was practically no chance a person would casually encounter a new species. Such spontaneous interest in a topic was rare, so rare that Roy encouraged the discussion to go on until the bell ended the class. "'Tomorrow we'll get back to the frog,' he said, smiling, when the class emitted a predictable groan. As he turned his attention to some papers on his desk, he caught a glimpse of Pete Fontaine about to leave. He smiled and gave a little wave. Pete smiled slightly in response. The most that he would allow himself, lest some other student accuse him of playing up to the teacher. Outside, he continued to feel good about the attention he had gotten and the discussion he had generated. He was feeling so good, in fact, that he decided to go visit Billy Peltzer after putting in a couple of hours as a Christmas tree. For the past few days, Billy had gotten up early and returned home as soon as he finished work at the bank. The reason, of course, was Gizmo. He was such a fascinating creature, Billy wanted to spend every minute with him. He was vulnerable, too. Once, while shaving, with Gizmo watching contentedly, Billy had accidentally turned the mirror so that it caught the hallway light and reflected it back at Gizmo. Shrieking loudly as the beam of bright light blinded him, Gizmo had toppled from the edge of Billy's desk into the waste can, falling on his head. By the time Billy got to him, the tiny creature was bruised, bleeding, and quivering with a shock and fear. He was in such a bad state that even Barney, still chafing with jealousy, whined in sympathy. Billy wrapped the wound in a bandage, talked soothingly to him for a long time, and eventually lulled him to sleep. The next day, Gizmo was markedly better. Billy was glad for... He would not enjoy taking Gizmo to a veterinarian who would have no idea what sort of animal he was. Watch Gizmo for me, will you, Mom? Billy called as he left the house for work. Why? she asked. He's in a cage, isn't he? Yeah, uh, but with that cut on his head and all. Okay, I'll drop in every once in a while and see how he's doing, she promised. And we can keep the hotline open to the vet. Thanks, Mom. He arrived at work early, a habit he'd taken up since the incident with Mrs. Deagle. The door to Roland Corbin's office was open, but no one else seemed to be in the bank. Hearing a rustle of paper, he hung up his coat and looked around for the source of the sound. Billy, he heard Kate's voice whisper. She was in Corbin's office. On the desk was a large map of Kingston Falls, detailed enough to include every street, home, and business. Some of the buildings were marked in red, all included in a section bounded by a dotted line. Kate was staring down at the map, her lips tight and eyes blazing. "'Have you seen this?' she asked. Billy shrugged. "'Kingston Falls,' he murmured. "'Yeah, I've been there.' She didn't appreciate his flippancy. "'Look at the places in red,' she said. "'What's it mean?' he asked. "'Those are the homes of people who are renting or leasing from Mrs. Deagle. "'Most of them are people who are out of work, laid off, "'or just can't afford to keep up with the payments. "'And Mrs. Deagle has taken advantage of that. "'How? She can't evict all those people at once. "'The heck she can't. But then who would pay the rent? She doesn't need the rent money. It looks like she's interested in a takeover. Here. Kate put her finger on one of the squares. Your house is in red. So's mine. Yeah, but that's not that far behind in the payments. Just one or two. Neither is my family. In fact, we're in okay shape. So what does the red mean? I think it means property she can take over in a hurry if she wants to. Something about options. What was she going to do with all of them? She wants to own everything. Why? What for? 
I heard them talking in the office a few days ago, Kate whispered. Mrs. Deagle's been having meetings with the president of Hitox Chemical. She wants to sell them the land. So they can build a plant here? Billy murmured aghast. Kate nodded. It's like a big monopoly game to her, he said. We're just pieces of paper to buy and sell. You got it, Kate replied. We've got to stop her, Billy. You and me? For starters, somebody's got to do something. Yeah, but what? That's what I say. What? A familiar voice asked. The response to Billy's query came not from Kate, but from Gerald Hopkins, who had entered quietly while the young couple were bent over the map. As they turned to look at him, their expression surprised and discomforted. He was in his glory. For the moment, at least, they were in his power. Snooping, huh? He smiled. Kate and Billy merely stared at him, there being no logical way they could deny their actions. Mr. Corbin doesn't like Snoopy employees, Gerald said as he slowly took off his coat and hung it in the closet. Enjoying the game of cat and mouse, he looked at Kate through narrowed eyelids. But maybe I don't have to tell him, he added meaningfully. Kate didn't answer. Are you busy tonight? Gerald asked. I'm busy every night, she replied with a toss of her head. She stormed out of the office. Gerald watched her go. Then turning to face Billy, he forced a smile. I like her, he said. She's tough, just like me. Just like you, Jer, Billy repeated derisively. I told you not to call me that. Sorry, Jer, I just keep forgetting. Billy smiled as he strolled out of the office. He and Kate had little chance to discuss the problem the rest of the day, although Billy thought about it quite a bit. Did it mean his family would be thrown out on the street? If so, where would they ever find a place as nice as their present home? Depressed at the end of the working day, Billy went directly home, hoping to find some solace in Gizmo or the new cartoon strip he was working on. Arriving home, he first went upstairs to check on Gizmo, who was sleeping peacefully, a happy smile on his face. Feeling a little better, he returned to the kitchen to find something good to eat. The refrigerator didn't offer much that interested him. He sighed. Have an orange, his mother suggested. Billy shrugged, took an orange from the refrigerator, and moved gingerly towards the unusual-looking appliance that sat on the top of the counter. I think you can use it now, Lynn smiled, no doubt sensing his nervousness. Your father tinkered with it last night, and it peeled an orange perfectly. One orange... Billy said, grinning. Out of how many? Don't ask, she said. Shrugging again, he opened the top of the device, across the side of which was inscribed, Peltzer Peeler Juicer. Flip the switch to peel and place the orange in the stainless steel bowl provided for it. Closing the lid, he pushed the start switch. The appliance immediately began to shake and make gurgling noises. Billy moved several feet away, experience having taught him that Dad's machines often had a way of giving one an un impromptu shower. This time, however, it seemed to be working. From the bottom of the device, a perfectly dry spiral of rind slowly unwound itself. Hey! Billy exclaimed. It peeled it perfectly! The machine shut itself off, and Billy opened the lid. Nothing was inside. Where's the orange? he demanded, turning the machine on the edge, shaking it, hitting its sides. It's supposed to be in the top, his mother said. No, he replied, it's not there. The darn thing peeled the orange and then ate it itself. Maybe that's what it's supposed to do, Lynn laughed. It's an automatic orange eating machine. They were still giggling a moment later when a knock sounded at the front door. Anybody home? Pete Fontaine asked, poking his head inside. Sure, come on in, Pete, Billy said. I brought you that tree your mom says she liked the other day, he said, dragging a scotch pine behind him. 
After replacing the sword, which had fallen right on cue, they set up the tree and studied it. Maybe I'd better see if I can get this trimmed before your father gets home, Lin said. I think he's been fooling around with something that hangs the tinsel automatically, and I'd rather not have him try it out. Would you like us to help? Pete asked politely. Not necessary. Thanks, though, she said. Why don't you go upstairs and look at Gizmo? That's right, Billy smiled, snapping his fingers. I've got a new pet. Oh, yeah? said Pete. What is it? I don't know. Nobody knows. Come on, Pete said skeptically. I'm not kidding, Billy insisted. Come on upstairs. See for yourself. Halfway up the steps, Pete said in a confidential tone of voice, I called up Mary Ann from Brizio last night. Asked her for a date. Yeah? How'd it go? Billy asked. Well, I was all ready to be smooth and confident, just like you said. But when she answered, I couldn't remember my name. Billy laughed. So I said, wrong number, in a real high voice, and hung up. Pete continued. Maybe I'll try again in a couple of days, uh, give her time to forget the voice. Well... Good luck, Billy said. Just remember that you're doing her a favor. Yeah, if I can remember my name. They entered the darkened room and made their way to the bedstand on which Gizmo's cage sat. Pete, who shared a room with his two brothers, was impressed with all the privacy Billy had. For one thing, there was a double bed all for himself, and Billy could arrange things just the way he wanted. Walking slowly, taking it all in, Pete was fascinated by the walls, which were covered with comic strips, medieval drawings, Frenzetta paintings of warriors. On the dresser was a miniature suit of armor, and farther on, a big drawing table covered with pens, pencils, erasers, a large green paper cutter, pink brushes soaking in cans, and a stack of drawings with an elaborate title page reading, The Secret of the Dragon's Lair. Below it, Billy had signed his name. Pete's mouth dropped open slowly. Golly, he said. You're really good. Billy smiled. Thanks. It'll look even better when I smooth out those colors. Somewhat embarrassed at the praise, Billy was thankful that Gizmo let out a high-pitched chirping noise, attracting both his and Pete's attention. The television set next to the bed was on, showing an old movie with Clark Gable as a racing car driver. Gizmo was watching with intense interest, almost as if he were a human being. Holy cow! What's that? Pete whispered. It's my new pet. We call him Gizmo. Where'd you get it? My dad brought it back from Chinatown. The two boys went to the edge of the bed, Pete kneeling so as to get a better look at the furry creature. You keep him in a cage all the time? he asked. No, just while I'm at work. We're afraid he might get into things. You see, he's very delicate. He can't stand light, and... The telephone rang. Billy answered it, and was delighted to hear the sound of Kate's voice, as she proceeded to tell him some more scuttlebutt that she had picked up at Dory's pub concerning Mrs. Deagle's plan. Billy gently lifted Gizmo from the box and held him in his lap. Pete moved closer so that he could stroke the animal and listen to the contented sounds he made. "'What happened between you and Gerald after I left?' Kate asked finally. "'Nothing much. I called him Jer a few times, that's all.' He handed Gizmo to Pete and leaned back against the pillow, enjoying this moment with Kate. He liked being her secret ally in the war against Mrs. Deagle, even if he had no idea what to do to thwart her takeover plan. Kate had plenty of ideas, however, most involving petitions and getting the story to the newspapers and television people. As he listened to her, Billy kept one eye on Pete and Gizmo. To give him some privacy, Pete had moved towards the drawing board and window, but as it was dark out, Billy saw no cause for alarm. Why don't you drop by the pub when I get off, and we'll talk some more about it? Kate asked. Uh, well, 
Billy stammered, suddenly realizing that she was very nearly asking him out for a date. Um, what time? I get off at eleven, she said. Sh sure, o okay, he murmured. If that's too late, it can keep, she added. You don't sound too hot on the idea. Oh, um, n no, he replied. I, I was just surprised. At what? No, never mind. We'll talk about it later. Okay, she said. If he can't make it, it's all right. No, uh, it's, uh... He saw the situation developing in the same sort of slow-motion action they used to show football and basketball replays. Gizmo, seated on the drawing table top, Pete stroking him, the edge of Pete's jacket sleeve catching on the paint can with the soaking brushes inside, the can tipping, a drop of water falling to the floor, then another, larger mass of water slopping over the rim, towards Gizmo's back. No! He heard himself shout. It was too late. As the water struck the tiny creature's back, Billy shouted, Accident! into the telephone, hung up, and hurling himself across the room, tried to wipe the beating water from Gizmo's body. A high-pitched scream told him the damage had already been done. His eyes wider than ever, his spine arched and mouth open, gasping. Gizmo rolled over and over on the drawing board. A crackling sound like a forest fire seemed to be coming from his body, forming a hideous counterpoint with his pitiful cries. What'd I do? Pete shouted, practically in tears. It's the water, Billy yelled back. It's not your fault. He can't be around water. Indeed, Gizmo appeared almost ready to burst. Five huge spots had formed on his back where the water had landed, and now they were growing, blood red and yellow, like mountainous blisters, spreading and popping like miniature volcanoes. The membranes tightened and stretched until one of them finally burst. A small furry ball popped out, landing on the desktop. Pete and Billy retreated, fascinated and horrified. Another ball popped from a second blister, then a third, fourth, and fifth. The crackling diminished then, as did Gizmo's cries of pain. Billy wondered if he was dying. In another minute, it was all over. Gizmo, his breathing gradually returning to normal, lay quietly as the blistered areas on his back bonded together and began to disappear like time-lapse photography of a wound healing. Thank goodness, Billy breathed. I think he's all right. But what are those things? Pete asked. The five balls had already started to grow and form themselves into shapes similar to Gizmo. Soon it was obvious that more Mogwai had been created. The two boys watched astounded as the creatures grew. This is better than the Twilight Zone, Pete murmured. I just wonder what my folks are going to say. Billy muttered darkly. Maybe they're good to eat, Pete offered. Now the five newcomers were half as large as Gizmo, who sat watching them with large, tearful eyes. Once or twice he glanced at Billy reproachfully, then looked away. Billy wondered if Gizmo was surprised by the incident, or if he had known or sensed that there was a possibility of its happening. Perhaps it had happened before. Even as they grew, Billy could tell that something was different. The new Mogwai had slightly different coloring than Gizmo, but that wasn't it. There was something strange about the expression on their faces and in their eyes. Though younger than Gizmo, they seemed less innocent. There was a craftiness there that Billy had never seen in Gizmo's large brown eyes. "'Can I have one?' Pete asked, interrupting Billy's thoughts. His first inclination was to say yes. Why not? If one of Gizmo was enough, six was certainly an excess. Yet Billy had no desire, having been careless once, to compound his error. Snatching up the paint can and mopping up every bead of water, he watched as the five new Mogwai continued to approximate Gizmo's size. I guess not, he said finally. 
This may be a nightmare, you know. Until we find out, I think it's best to keep them all here. Pete nodded thoughtfully. Maybe we should take one of them to Mr. Hansen and find out if it's a new species or not. That's a good idea, Billy replied. We could be rich and famous. Billy wasn't so sure. Everything had happened so fast. Suppose instant reproduction occurred again. He remembered the Star Trek episode in which the cuddly creatures known as Tribbles practically took over the entire spaceship. He had had a quick vision of Mogwai stopping up the pipes of his home, lying wall to wall in every room and hallway, a blanket of squealing animals crying out for food even as they continued multiplying. Suppose more of them made them dangerous in some way. If they took over the neighbors' homes, would the police arrest Billy for starting the problem? And on a more immediate level, what explanation could he give Mom and Dad? He had been careless and violated the Chinese boy's admonition. To Pete, the new arrivals added up to being rich and famous. To Billy, they spelled nothing but trouble.